to bring the word. All right. I heard we have some radical young people here. Some young people that are extreme for Jesus. Anybody here like that? You know, when I, when I met Larry, all I could think of as a, as a guy that's so, so turned on for God that I, he has not changed one bit. His drive for the Lord, his drive to do well and to excel in the things of God, and especially for youth, urban youth workers, uh, institutes like this, this is what he lives for. This is what he is called to, is to equip a generation to reach out to a hurting generation. And I want you to give one more hand for Larry Acosta for having me and for having you. And for having this great event, give him, come on, give him a good hand one more time. I know it takes a lot of work to do this. And uh, before I get into my message, I just want to say that I, I, I've been excited about this opportunity for the last, since I've heard that they wanted me to come and preach and speak, actually. And I've been looking forward to it, and I believe I have a good word from, from the Lord for, for this uh, group of people that are here tonight. But I just want to acknowledge my... my uh, my wife, before I get into this, because she's carrying our third child. And I want her to stand. My beautiful wife, Kim. Kimberly. And uh, there's a whole story behind it. Maybe I'll get into it. Maybe I won't. <laughs> but it's a real good story about how we got together and how God made that happen. And it took me into an evolving level, another level of growth. When we came together, God took my ministry to new levels. And not that it, I did it for that purpose, but that was a secondary reason or secondary thing that happened as a result of our marriage and waiting on God. And what I want to talk to you about tonight is about that word evolve, but I want to make sure that we understand what that word means and we have a clear understanding what we're talking about with that word evolve. And you find in the dictionary, the Bible, the, the Bible, <laughs> Webster says, not the Bible, Webster says in the second definition, it says to derive or educe. To produce by natural evolution are the processes of develop or to work out. And I want us to think about that for a moment. Evolving, really, it could come by natural circumstance, or it could become also in, when you're in Christ, it could come through supernatural, by supernatural means and also by the Spirit. It could be intentional. It could be something that you allow God to do the work in you so he could do the work through you. And I want you to look at, at if you have a Bible, if you don't, it's okay. In, in Isaiah chapter 40, I want us to look up one verse, a couple of verses here, and I'm going to jump right into the meat of what I want to talk to you about. Are you still here? I want us to learn how to be excited, just equally excited about the word as we are about any other thing that's gone on. If this generation grabs that and makes that a principle, we're going to see an explosion all over the world. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, are you with me? If you don't have it, just say amen. <laughs> That's all right, because I'm still going still gonna to go for it. Okay, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Say wait. Come on, say it out loud. Wait. Tell the person next to you, say wait. Shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. I want to pray. Lord, we thank you for your everything you're doing here at this, this convention. I pray that you would just use me as one of, your, one of the players here, God, one of the ones that are here to, to just establish something fresh in the hearts of your young people and your youth leaders. I pray, God, that you would use me, Lord God, as an, as, as an encouragement to somebody that's maybe hurting right now, to somebody that's going through the process of evolution and they don't understand it. They're going through that process of evolving, of changing, in their life that they don't fully understand what they're going through. But God, I pray you make it clear today what that process involves and what it's going to come out, the outcome of that is going to be. I give you all the praise and all the glory. I thank you in advance for what you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, when you think about Evolve, you think about, I thought right when they gave me the topic, I thought about evolution. And I thought about how, how that word has really swept our nation and our world, that concept. But I believe that in God, all things work together for a purpose. The Bible says, for God works all things together for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He works it out for the good of an individual. And we have to understand something very clear, that God wants the best for us. Satan tries to come and to distract, divert, and detach us from God's best. 
He wants to blind us from God's plan for our life. But when we first get saved, we have to learn to first set ourselves in the Lord. In other words, we got to set our own agenda aside. When we give our heart to the Lord, when we surrender our heart to Jesus, how many of you remember that day when you gave your heart to the Lord? Anybody? I remember when I was 19 years old, I was a baseball player, and I thought I was going to be a professional baseball player. I was playing at one of the colleges, community colleges, out here in Pasadena, Pasadena City College I was playing at. And I was playing there, and I thought I was doing pretty well, but then all of a sudden I was starting to get involved in partying throughout my high school years, and I started going out and doing those crazy things that you do, drinking and, and going to clubs and doing everything they do out in that, in that time. But I was a pastor's kid. That was the other part of it. I grew up in the church. I grew up with a lot of ex-homeboys, ex-homegirls, guys that used to be drug addicts, girls that used to be uh, hooked on heroin, hooked on coke, people from all parts of the inner city, the hardcores. I, I mean, everybody in our church had a tattoo, except for me. And so when I got saved, I was like an oddball in our own church because I grew up in West Covina. I went to South Hills High School. I, uh, the, some of the professional ball, ball players today that you would know are, are, I played with. I played with Jason Jombie. How many of you heard of him? Jason Jombie was a sophomore when I was playing as a senior there, and I used to strike him out in practice. I used to do pretty good. <laughs> I wish I could keep those records. <laughs> but, you know, I was, I was a man that was driven with a purpose for baseball at that time. But yet, I had some things pulling me down from fulfilling that plan, and that was called searching for real fulfillment, searching for real happiness, and I couldn't find it in just baseball alone. I ended up finding it back where I started, at church. At 19 years old, I'm sitting in the back of the auditorium. My dad was preaching, at, and I had to go to church. How many of you are PKs, or preacher's kids, you grew up in the church? All right. How many of you had to go to church, pretty much? Okay, I was the same way. I, I don't get allowance, I don't get money, I don't get nothing. So I made sure I showed up. If I was late, I just showed up and showed up and, and touched base with them, and then I left and did what, I, did what I wanted to do. So that was one of those Sundays. I came to church late, but I was, this time I came depressed. I came a little bit down. And this one individual talked to me on the way in, and he began to tell me, hey, man, you need to change your life. And he didn't preach at me, but he, he connected with me. He related to me where I was at. This, this gentleman happened to be somebody that transferred into our ministry midway as I was growing up, and he was a PK too. So he knew how to talk to me where I was at. He wasn't coming down hard on I me. Mean, he wasn't in your face style. He was just relating to me. And he built a friendship with me all the way up to that point of that morning when he actually was a seed. He planted a seed in me. Right before I went in, I was able to give my heart to the Lord. And when I gave my heart to the Lord that day, I made a decision at 19 years old that if I'm going to give my heart to Jesus, I'm going all the way. I've seen too many people and there's a lot of people in this generation, I call them the fakes, the flakes, the flirts, and the fanatics. There's a lot of people that are faking it. There's a lot of people that are flaking it. There's a lot of people that are fanatical, but they have no real direction. And there's a lot of people that are flirts, and they're trying to pick up in the house of God. In this gener in not just in this generation, in the previous one, too. And I would see a lot of that going on, casual Christianity or compromising Christianity, but I saw very few committed ones. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to give my heart to the Lord, I want to make sure that I live up to the standard and to the standards that God has, has, has saved me for, and that's to live a holy life, a live a life that's separated and sanctified unto the Lord. I'm not talking about a perfect life. I'm not talking about a, a, a life that you, you're fail-proof, that you're not going to make mistakes. I'm talking about a life lived by the grace of God, but desirous of the best of God. To be a man after God's own heart. And so as I give my heart to the Lord, I, I, I begin to ask him, God, what do you have for me? What is it there that you have for me? What's the purpose in my life? And, and four things I want to just mention that the process, about the process of God that could go in any level where you're headed or any transition or any changes that you may, go in, may be going through, you could probably put it under these four words. I want to give them to you right now. Set, settled, seasoned, and soaring. Set, settled, seasoned, and soaring. When you get set in God, you really, you begin to set your mind upon his word and upon his, his, what he wants for your life. And the Bible talks about, in Romans chapter 12, it talks about not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you begin to prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. The real purpose in life is to know God's will and fulfill his will. 
The Bible also says, delight yourself in the Lord. He shall give you the desires of your heart. You know that God even throws in things for free? He throws in the extra desires that you have in the natural. You know, I was into baseball, and I, I loved playing ball. And when I got saved and I gave my heart to God, that was one of the things that was difficult for me to give up. But he began to change my desire. I didn't quit baseball overnight. No one made me quit baseball. But I had a desire to separate myself to God, to get to know what God had for me, because I wanted to live a life of purpose, a life with, 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 with excitement, a life that would not be one that's just floating through life or just becoming someone that's a follower. But I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to help other people that needed God. I wanted to be one that could help others that were shy and timid like myself. I wanted to help someone else that could not speak in their own, in their own uh, perfect, they couldn't speak well. I, I couldn't speak well. I couldn't even call for a pizza. That's, I was so uh, shy and very, very timid. But when God got a hold of my life, he gave me a desire. He put something in me that I said, I don't want to be like the rest. I want to be something that people can look to and follow. And I know there's a group of people in this room right now that you're here for that same purpose. God has set you aside, he set you apart, and you're set, and you're ready for action. You're ready to run this race. I got in that set position, and I began to, like, kind of like when you get ready to run a race, you get in that set position, and then when the gun goes off, boom, you go. Well, the Lord told me to go to Amsterdam, Holland. We had a ministry out there. That's all right, give it up for Amsterdam. <laughs> Amsterdam, Holland. How many of you heard of Amsterdam? Now, Think about it in the natural. Going to Amsterdam, Holland, you're thinking, it's a party, right? There's a red light district. They have hashish. They have marijuana. They have all this stuff. They have everything you want, and it's illegal, or at least it's permitted. And you don't have to have an ID. You don't have to be a certain age. You can just go over there and just party your life away. But I went there on a different purpose, on a different mission, and that was to get set and settled in the things of God to make sure that my foundation was secure. And it's key to understand, I want you to understand something, that the way to last in the long haul, it depends a lot on your beginning. On the beginning stages of your relationship with the Lord, you have to establish, to, you have to get to know him. You got to begin to know him as you get to know God through his word and by his spirit and through prayer and through a true dedication and separation unto the Lord. All of a sudden you find yourself changing from the inside out. It's not something that you make happen from the outside in, but the inside out, the Holy Spirit, as you yield to his spirit, all of a sudden you don't have the same desires that you used to have. Because now you want to do the work of God. Now you want to desire the things of God that are eternal rather than things that are temporal. I'm not talking about being fanatical in a, in a bad sense. I'm talking about being turned on for God in a clear purpose type of, uh, type of way. And, and I was so turned on to God, I, I began to separate myself. I said, God, I don't want to just be a preacher. Because they're telling me you're going to be like Nikki Cruz. You're going to be like your dad. You're going to be like this one or that one. I go, I don't want to be what they want me to be. I want to be what you want me to be. I don't, can't preach anyway, God. I can't even talk. I used to stutter a lot. I still do sometimes. But God began to speak to my heart. And he said, you're called, Sonny Jr. Not because of what your dad did, but because I've called you. And I needed to hear from God. And he spoke to me very clear when I was separate. You know, when I went over there, I went into the home. Anyone ever heard of our rehab homes? Victory Outreach has, I know. They, they wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning. These are the drug addicts that we that bring in. And to kick their habit, we got to teach them discipline. And we also got to pray over them to get the deliverance that they need. But a lot of our people are coming irresponsible. They come in with no money. They come in with no family, really, that's taking care of them. And so what we do is get a house, a roof over their head. We get clothing for them. We get food on their table, and we give them the Lord, Jesus Christ. And there's a disciplinary uh, schedule that we have. They would get up at 5 in the morning in Amsterdam. And at 5 in the morning in Amsterdam, <laughs> it was dark, but then it stayed dark in the wintertime until 9 o'clock because they're up on the higher part of the hemisphere. And so after... Five o'clock, get up. We have to get up. Then we have to get our devotion. We hear the devotion. Then after we do all that, then we have to do chores. Then I got to clean toilets. Then I got to sweep the floor. And this is in Victory Outreach Movement. And I'm the founder's son, catch this now, doing their toilets. And theirs smell just as bad as ours or more. <laughs> and I'm doing this thinking I could just be at home right now in my forerunner, hanging around with my friends and just being a Christian, but not so committed like this and so fanatical. At times that would begin to enter my mind. I could just be a youth pastor by asking my dad, can I take the youth? But I didn't want it that way. 
I wanted the process of God. I'm not here to pat myself on the back. I'm here to let you know that I wanted God's best because I knew that I needed it. I knew I needed discipline. I knew I needed God to change me from the inside out because I had desires that still were not dealt with. I still had a desire to go party once in a while. I still had a desire to see what my friends were doing. I still had that pooling at times when I first got saved. For the first year of my salvation, I was hungry for God, but yet I had that temptation pulling me into the world. And I had a lot of friends. I had a lot of buddies, and I had some access to resource so I could be able to drive. I could be able to take them out. I could do a lot of stuff. But then God constrained me, restrained me by his spirit. Get yourself, set yourself apart. Set yourself aside. Separate yourself unto me, son, because I have a plan for you. So I did that. I separated myself. God spoke to me. He made it clear to me that I'm called. After seven months in that home, I came back on a mission. I came back on a mission, and I began to preach the word of God with boldness, with clarity. All of a sudden, I began to know that I'm called of God, and the fruit was showing. And God gave me a, 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 a God idea when I was preaching at a conference, and I just had taken over our Youth International. It was barely beginning to start taking off in our ministry, where we had a lot of young people, but they were undisciplined young people. They would make they would pass notes during the message. They would be flirting with each other. They would be having their, you know, do you like me? You know, do the box. Yes, no, maybe. They would be talking. They would be standing up. We had homeboys sitting in our service for, for weeks and months, but they didn't give their hearts to the Lord. I had confrontations with them where I finally got fed up with them, and I went outside, and I said, you know, are you guys going to start living right or what? Are you going to start acting right or what? Are you going to come here to church? Are you going to start listening and paying attention? Or are you going to keep on disturbing and interrupting what I'm doing? And they began to look at me and say, hey, Holmes, this guy's serious, hey. I'm telling you, Holmes, let's go get him. So they wanted to get me, but then I had Tiny. This guy's Tiny. He's not Tiny. He's huge. He stood in front and said, what, Pastor? What, you want to take him in the back? And I go, I would, but we can't. <laughs> but things like that, I began to get so bold that I was outside of myself at times. I was beginning to function under the power of a spirit. And th- but not just, I didn't confront them in that way only. I confronted them with love. And we did as a youth ministry. Our youth workers were dedicated. Our youth leaders were dedicated to reaching out to young people. It wasn't so ingrown that we were into our own thing. We weren't into just worship. We weren't into just the things of having church. We were into reaching out to the hurting and lost. And that began to take fire in the hearts of people, and they began to get mission-minded. Young people began to rise up, and then one of our conferences, at, in the 92 conference, I was speaking a message about this generation and I was saying, we're not the next generation. We're not just the X generation. We're not the Joshua generation. We're not just the Lazarus generation. We're not just a generation that's just here today and gone tomorrow. We're a generation that exists for purpose. We're a generation that's on fire for God. We're a generation that's not the next, not the X, but the now generation. And as I began to share that, the now generation, it began to grab hold in the hearts of our young people. And all of a sudden, it took off. And people began to say, I'm part of a now. I'm part of something. I'm part of this ministry. The young people that were PKs growing up in our ministry began to cling to it. And the young people that were from the streets began to come together and to form the gang. God's anointed now generation. It's not limited, but it's inclusive, not exclusive. Inclusive of different nationalities, from people from Holland, people from, people from Asia, people from Africa, people from all over the world, from Australia, from, from all over the nation have joined this gang. And it's a gang that's out to do destruction of one thing. Not destroy lives, not destroy neighborhoods, not destroy people, but destroy the works of darkness. And pull down the strongholds and see people liberated by the power of God and come in bold in the name of the Lord. To go into the highways and byways, to go into the places that people don't want to go. Not just to go one time visit, not just just do a little little gathering there and just have a little session so you could take pictures. We went in there, we went in there by the dozens, by the hundreds, and we would stay there, we would start churches called Victory Outreach. And now today it's blossomed into a worldwide movement through through the dedication of young people. And the same thing God wants to do in your life. He wants to use you to make a difference. Maybe you're not called to be somebody that's gonna take a world or take a big city but you're called to be a part of doing that. You're called to help somebody. You're called to help one. And when you get set in God, there's a foundation that's clear. That, that you realize that it's God that's called me. I can't run from this calling. I can't deny that I'm called. People will make fun of you. They made fun of me. I didn't fit in our church, in our movement, because I was awkward. it was awkward for me because I, was, I always looked like a square, basically. <laughs> And compared to everyone else, you know, they had, everyone had at least one track mark or 
They, you know, they had a br- brush, you know, they had a big old mustache. They couldn't see, you know, their lips. They didn't smile very often in the early days. And I felt a little bit awkward being a part of it. In fact, I would be like a little bit intimidated. But then God began to show me that you, all, you do belong, Sonny. That it doesn't, you don't have to relate to people. You don't have to be a drug addict to relate to a drug addict. You don't have to be a gang member to be able to touch a gang member. What you need to have is what Jesus had. Jesus had a heart for the hurting. He was never a leper. He was never a prostitute. He was never into all that lifestyle. But he had a heart and he loved. If you carry my heart, if they see a genuine compassion, they will follow me and they'll follow after the way that I have presented to them through your life. And the same thing, God wants to use your life. He don't want you to be intimidated. The enemy wants to intimidate this generation. The enemy wants to keep us back. And when you're in that position where you're getting set and settled for, for, for a calling of God, you've got to remember there's opposition to every mission. If you're going God's way, you've got to expect resistance. Expect resistance. Expect things not to go right. Expect, you to, expect people to cut you off on the freeway when you're trying to go to a meeting. Expect somebody to, to get you aggravated on the way to, to a prayer meeting. Expect someone to flip you off. Expect all that stuff. It's going to happen. It happens even more. The more you get dedicated, the more the enemy wants to come and discourage you. He wants to oppose the mission because he knows you're going to make a difference. As soon as you make up your mind to be confident in the Lord, as soon as you make up your mind, like Joshua says, I'm going to sanctify sanctify yourselves today for tomorrow I'll do wonders among you. As soon as you decide to sanctify, set yourself apart to God, renew your mind in the spirit and by his word, all of a sudden you begin to get... uh, you begin to get conflict. You begin to get opposition because now you're making headway, true headway in the things of God. You're no longer just floating in the things of God. You're no longer just existing in God. Now you have purpose and direction and you're moving in God and you're making your way purposeful. Everything you're doing is you're doing with purpose. Not like you're a robot. You're still fun. You're still excited to be around. People still like you, but you're on purpose doing what you're called to do. You're making a difference. Everything you do has purpose. You gotta be determined. To not let nothing stop your relationship with the Lord. Not let nothing stop your plan that God has for you. And I began to catch a hold of God. I need your strength. I would sit on a couch one time. I was, this is like two years into youth ministry. Things weren't happening for me. How many of you are having a hard time sometimes relating to young people? Be honest. Have you ever, ever had a hard time? I changed my style like four or five times. <laughs> it couldn't work, man. I was not me. I tried to wear the, you know, the penalty. And yeah, it didn't work. The hat backwards. Didn't work. Try to talk their language. Ah, loser. Zero. Eh, done. I was not dark enough. I was not eloquent enough. I did not know the language of the inner city that well. I couldn't relate in the natural. But something happens in the supernatural realm when you give your heart completely to God and to the people. God's able to use anyone. And I began to say, God, I need your supernatural anointing. I need your help because I can't relate to the people on my own. So I'm sitting there one time in my house, laying down on the couch on a Saturday afternoon, getting ready to go to a car wash after that game. I was watching a baseball game. The Dodgers were playing. And as I was laying down watching the game, I'm, sit, I'm laying down, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, I could have been in there somewhere, even if I was just for a little while in the major leagues. And this, I'm going to get into the, to the good part right now where the dream came to pass in, in one way. Where I was laying down, and I was eating a Twinkie. I loved Twinkies at that time. I can't afford to have one now. <laughs> it just stays right there, you know. <laughs> so I'm 22 years old, going to Bible college, my second year of Bible college. I'm not the greatest student, but I was good. And I was excited about the things of God, but that day I was on a downer. How many of you have been on a down day? Like, oh, God, this is like ridiculous. I want to quit. And I was frustrated. They wouldn't follow me. We would, get, we would go up 100 people, then we'd go down to 50. Then we'd go to 200 one night, then down to three to, to, three to 30 or so. It was up and down. I said, God, I don't want to waste my life with this. I want to do something that's effective. So anyway, I'm laying there watching the game. All of a sudden, they begin to pan the camera to the bullpen. And in the bullpen, they begin to announce the player. Joey Eichen from West Covina. California, from, he came from West Coast, and he started talking about him, and I played with Joey all my life. He was a pitcher, and I didn't know he, he had made it to the bigs. They said, we just, they just traded for him from, the, from one of the teams in the East, and he's his first de- debuting in the major leagues. And I'm watching it, and I, my mouth dropped, and my Twinkie fell. 
and I'm looking, I go, I'm laying down like, and I'm doing the youth ministry, going to car, car wash. And he's at least making a couple hundred thousand, doing what he loves to do. I loved baseball. And it reminded me, see, when you're going through hard times, times of discouragement, you've got to be aware that the enemy's going to come whisper to you, you're wasting your time, you're wasting your life. You used to be so popular. People used to like you. Now you're eating fat. You're eating Twinkies. <laughs> People are thinking you're, you're a nerd now and you were so in, in style at one time. People used to, all the girls used to love you. They used to write you. No, I'm kidding. I'm exaggerating that part. I had a few, but I wasn't like your Mac Daddy or anything. I wasn't no, no superstar in that world, okay? But I had, I, I, I had enough, you know. I had my play, my play. So I'm thinking, oh, he has it made. And I'm over here sitting on a couch, going to school, call to youth that don't even want to hear the message. I could pitch better than him. I had a better record at 18 years old than he had when he was 18. I was doing better than him. But there he is, and there here I am. My dream hasn't unfolded completely, but his dream has come to pass. And when you're sitting there comparing yourself, you got to be aware that something's going to come in if you allow it to, and that's diversion or diversion of the enemy. He's going to get you. If he can't get you to backslide, he'll get you diverted. And you know what I started doing after that? I began to get my glove. I went to the car wash, did that thing, but I had baseball in my mind. I started getting, started playing catch again. I started working out. I started playing baseball again. And we ended up playing, our church team ended up playing against East LA College, and they had me pitch. I hadn't pitched in two or three years. And I got ready for this game for a month. I just got in condition as much as I could. I pitched against this team that was already playing in East LA. East LA College came to our campus at Victory Outreach. I'm going to be done in about seven minutes, but I want you to stay, pay attention. What happened is this, is that I pitched. We had ragtag uniforms. We didn't have uniforms. They had all their, their get-up. They had all their bags. They came in like a team. We came in like a bad, bad news bears of Victory Outreach La Puente. <laughs> and so I went up there and started pitching. And boom. I got to start getting everybody out. Five innings of one hit. They only got one hit off me. And I, didn't, I only walked one guy. And I struck out at least one every inning. So the coach began to ask and inquire, hey, who is that guy? They go, well, he's our youth pastor. Well, can he play for our team? So guess what? I said, sure I can. But do I have to go to your school? Yes, you got to take some classes, basket weaving classes. Do something, you know. So... So I, I said, if it's possible, I'd like to go to both schools. My school that I'm attending now presently, Life Bible College at that time, and, and still go. I wanted to stay in pursuit of my call and still kind of play over here my sport. And maybe God could use this because I never threw, knew, I didn't think that God wanted to throw baseball out completely, you know. I thought he could use that as a platform, <laughs> try to justify it. So I began to try that out, but then I found out this, I found out that I can't go to that school full-time and East LA College and play. I had to make a choice. And that was decision-making time because these people really wanted me to play. And scouts would go out every time to check out the players. And so I had to make a decision. And I made a decision to remain in school, Bible College. I, had, I made a decision to stick with God's plan. And then a couple years, like a year after that, God began to give us a breakthrough. We had about 500 young people in our church locally, and we got to see a revival take place in our youth. Then all of a sudden around the world, God began to raise up young leaders around the world to catch the fire, to catch this vision, to raise up the now generation. And because I remained, because I was set and settled, because God spoke to me, because I was assured of God's plan, even though it didn't look good at that time during the transition, during a change, during the formation of my character, during the formation and my evolving in the things of God, I, I didn't know much then. I still don't know a lot, but I know more than I did then. I remained in God. I remained on the pathway of purpose, and nothing could divert me from it, especially when I made a stand that day. I made a decision to follow after God's own heart and God's plan, and I'm so grateful today because after after that, shortly after that, about three years later, I was able to pitch a first pitch at Dodger Stadium before all the people, right before a game. Just a side dream came to pass. Just an extra. God throws in the extras. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he shall direct your path. 
The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Every need you have, every desire you have, if you align yourself to God's desires, it shall be done for you. If you learn how to abide in him and his words abide in you, you shall ask what you desire, and it shall be done. And what you do shall remain because it's God's fruit being produced through your life. Are you evolving by natural forces or are you evolving by spiritual forces? Are you being seasoned by God? Because that's the next step, the seasoning of God. He allows trials. He allows tribulation. He allows hardships to come into our life. Not to hurt us, not to harm you, not to keep you down, but to use that to break things off of you. Learn that, to, to begin to melt away the, 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 the dross and get that stuff out and get you purified for the next level that he wants to take you to. You want a big ministry? Expect big trials. You want to have friends? Then be a friend. If you want to have people changed in your, in your ministry, then you have to learn how to change yourself by allowing God to do the work in you. It's not all easy. Now I am a senior pastor at our church in La Puente. We call it the Mother Church. I was a youth pastor at that time. Then I went through a whole other set of changes as a senior pastor. At that time, I was single. Now I'm married. At that time, I didn't have... I didn't have what I have today, two, two baby boys and a girl on the way. But I had a process of God working in my life, and I wouldn't change a thing. I thank God for the work he's done in my life. And I count it a privilege to serve him. And I love young people. I started out reaching young people. Now I'm touching a whole group of people, older, younger, people that used to change my diapers. They would tell me, too, they go, hey. Study, Joey, you study, boy. Oh, cute. Go do me, ho. And so, I'm your pastor now. Don't forget about that, please. Let me pray for you quick. Get out of here. I'm I didn't say that. No, you know, I was just kidding that part. I just threw that in for fun. But now, I'm so grateful because I'm hitting another level now. And I'm not here to promote myself, I'm here to give you encouragement. I'm not here to build our ministry up because we have enough on our plate right now. I'm here to let you know that you could do it. If I could do it, you could do it. You could make it through your trials. You can make it through your temptations. You could get by, but don't get by on your own merit. Get by in God. Be accountable. Get in, into the spirit. Let God change you from the inside out. Be one that lasts the long haul. Don't be a one that's, a, a, you know, a flare that just goes and it's gone. Be one that stays and remains. And the only way you're going to do that is by getting a hold of God and him getting a hold of you and remaining in the pathway of purpose. As you're set, you settle in that, you begin to find a flow, then seasonings of God where trials, tribulation, yourself comes against you, the devil comes against you, people come against you, circumstances come against you, but you gotta know that God's still working it out for your best interest. For all things work together for the good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I want every head bowed and right closed for a minute. Lord, we came to this conference not because we had to, but because we wanted to. I pray for every student, I pray for every worker, every leader, everyone that's just curious, that came here for different reasons. But I believe the main reason, they want something different in their life. I pray that you would do that work that you did in me many years ago. For those that are at the initial stages of the process of God, I pray you work in them, Lord to bring out the best. I pray for those that are thinking that their ministry is not going anywhere, but they know they're called. I pray that you would align them to your plan and begin to walk step by step with them, God, through every stage, through every step, that they will bear, bear fruit if they remain, as they continue to be faithful to the plan and the mission that you've given their heart, them in their heart. I pray, God, for every group that's represented, that you begin to grow their ministry and expand it. Let it not just evolve by, by just natural force or, or just by accident, but let it be purposeful. Let it be intentional. Let them begin to reach out with purpose and begin to build up and equip for the mission that is at hand. I thank you, Lord. I pray you encourage every person here. And I pray, Lord, that you would renew our faithful uh, stand that we've taken years ago, some of us years ago, some of us want to do it today. We want to make a stand for you today, God. If you want to stand to your feet and say, I want to make a new stand, I want to recommit my heart, go ahead and stand with all over this place. Stand up and make a declaration that you're going to be different, that you're going to be different, that you're going to grow, that you're going to develop, and that your development's not going to be by chance, it's going to be by choice. 
as you allow God to flow through your life. As they go ahead and sing that chorus, we have about 30 seconds just to worship him for a minute. Go ahead. And then we're going to give it over to Pastor Brother Larry. Just thank you, Lord.